Open Success Center, with funding from Title V, presents The Working Cell, a biology workshop. Hi, I'm Steve. Fluid mosaics are a mosaic in that they have diverse protein molecules embedded in a framework of phospholipids. The membrane is fluid in that most of these molecules can drift about in the membrane. Double bonds in the unsaturated fatty acid tails of many phospholipids produce kinks that prevent phospholipids from packing tightly together, keeping the membrane fluid. In animal cells, the steroid cholesterol wedged into the bilayer helps stabilize the membrane at warm temperatures, but also helps keep the membrane fluid at lower temperatures. Some proteins give the membrane a strong framework. These proteins, called integrins, span the membrane and attach the cytoskeleton on the inside and the extracellular matrix on the outside. Glycoproteins are involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition, a second function of plasma membrane proteins. Enzymes found within the plasma membrane may work as a team to carry out sequential steps and pathways. Let's observe this pathway. Notice that these two enzymes may work together to synthesize the green circle from the yellow triangle. First, the left enzyme converts the triangle into a square. Then, the right enzyme takes the square and converts into our ending product, the green circle. Other proteins function as receptors for chemical messengers from other cells. A receptor protein has a shape that fits a specific messenger. Often the binding of the messenger to the receptor triggers a chain reaction involving other proteins which relay the messages to molecules that perform specific functions inside the cell. This message transfer process is called signal transduction. A final important function of membrane proteins is in transport. Membranes exhibit selective permeability, that is they allow some substances to cross more easily than others. Nonpolar molecules can easily pass through the membrane. In contrast, polar molecules have a difficult time crossing the membrane. Therefore, these molecules pass through membrane proteins that facilitate the transport of these polar molecules, usually with the use of energy. Passive transport is diffusion across a membrane with no energy investment. Diffusion is a tendency for particles of any kind to spread out evenly in an available space, moving from where they are more concentrated to regions where they are less concentrated. Molecules vibrate and move randomly as a result of a type of energy called heat. Diffusion requires no work. It results from the thermal motion of atoms and molecules. Because a cell does not perform work when molecules diffuse across a membrane, the diffusion of a substance across a biological membrane is called passive transport. Let's observe the, this example of diffusion. First, notice the high concentration of the green dye molecules to the left of the membrane. Diffusion allows for the movement of the molecules to pass through the membrane into a lower concentrated area until an equilibrium is met. The term tenacity describes the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. The tenacity of a solution mainly depends on its concentration of solids that cannot cross the plasma membrane relative to the concentration of solids in the cell. The solute concentration of a cell and its isotonic environment are essentially equal and that the cell gains water at the same rate that it loses it. For an animal cell, the isotonic environment is normal. For the plant cell, this environment leaves the cell flaccid or soft. In a hypotonic solution, the solution has a solid concentration lower than that of the cell. For an animal cell, the cell gains water, swells, and may burst like an overfilled balloon. The plant cell, however, can avoid lysis because of its strong cell wall and its ability to store water within its vacuole. In animal cell, in a hypertonic solution, the solution has a higher solute concentration. The cell shrivels and can die from water loss. From this particular type of solution, both animal and plant cells experience plasmolysis, which is the shriveling effect. Recall that nonpolar hydrophobic molecules can dissolve in the lipid bilayer of a membrane and cross it with ease. Numerous substances that do not diffuse freely across the membranes because of their polarity or charge can move across the membrane with the help of specific transport proteins. When one of these proteins make it possible for a substance to move down its concentration gradient, the process is called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport because it does not require energy. In active transport, a cell must expend energy to move a solute against its concentration gradient that is, across the membrane toward the side where the solute is more concentrated. 
The solid energy molecule ATP supplies the energy for most active transport. The process begins when a solid on the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane attaches to a specific side on the transport protein. Next, then ATP transfers one of its phosphate groups to the transport protein. The phosphorylation causes the membrane to change its shape in such a way that the solid is released on the other side of the membrane. Lastly, then the phosphate group detaches and the transfer protein returns to its original shape, ready for a new round of active transport. So far, we have discussed the transport of small substances across the cell membrane. Now let's discuss the transport of bulky materials. A cell uses the process of exocytosis to export large materials such as proteins or polysaccharides. Uh, the example of this was shown in the tour of the cell, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about endocytosis now. So endocytosis is the opposite. It is a transport process that in which a cell takes in substances. A depression in the plasma membrane pinches in and forms a vesicle enclosing material that had been outside the cell. Here's an example. Phagocytosis, or cellular eating, a cell engulfs a particle by wrapping extensions called pseudopodia around it and packaging it within a cell membrane enclosed sac large enough to be called a vacuum. Here is a live picture of a cell performing phagocytosis. Pinocytosis, or cellular drinking, the cell gulps droplets of fluid into tiny vesicles. Pinocytosis is not specific, it takes in any and all solutes dissolved in the droplets. Again here, we see a picture of a cell performing pinocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is highly specific in contrast to pinocytosis. Receptor proteins for specific molecules are embedded in regions of the membrane that are lined by a layer of coat proteins. Energy is defined as the capacity to perform work. Work is performed when an object is moved against an opposing force such as gravity or friction. There are two basic forms of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Moving objects can perform work by transferring motion to other matter. Heat or thermal energy is a form of kinetic energy. An example of kinetic energy here in these pictures is the far right picture. As a man is biking down the hill, he's releasing thermal energy as the wheels rub against the floor, um, going against friction. Now, potential energy is a second form of energy that we like to discuss. Uh, it is a stored energy that an object possesses at a res as a result of its location or structure. Um, as we see here in the middle picture, we have a man who's on top of the hill. He has a great potential energy because of his location on top of a hill. He has a potential to eventually go down the hill and have a great energy. Chemical energy is a term that's referred to the potential energy available for the release in a chemical reaction, which is what we're going to discuss uh, in a little bit. Thermodynamics is a study of energy transformations that occur in a collection of matter. The first law of thermodynamics, energy can be transferred and transformed, but it cannot be created or destroyed. An example would be the kinetic energy, or rather the motion, that a car vehicle produces. It's safe to say that the car converted the chemical energy from gasoline to produce its motion. In short, chemical energy was transferred into kinetic energy. The second law of thermodynamics. Energy conversions increase the entropy of the universe. Well, what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of disorder. An analogy that I like to use to explain the second law of thermodynamics is the bedroom analogy. Now imagine a clean and organized room. It's safe to say, however, that through time, your clean and organized room will eventually become disordered. In other words, your bedroom will become a mess. Your bedroom has a natural tendency to become disordered. Energy must be applied to bring the room back to an organized fashion. This is the same for any energy process. The universe, like your room, has a tendency to be disordered. ATP powers nearly all forms of cellular work. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. The adenosine part of ATP consists of adenine, a nitrogenous base, and ribose, a 5-carbon sugar. The triphosphate part is a chain of three phosphate groups. When the bond of the third group breaks by hydrolysis, the third phosphate is released as well as energy. ATP molecule now becomes adenosine diphosphate because it only has two phosphate groups. So how is it that ATP has the ability to perform work? Well, one example is chemical work.
The phosphorylation of reactants provides energy to drive the synthesis of products. In this example, we have the formation of a molecule. As a result of the end of ATP's work, we notice that ATP now becomes ADP, and there's also another third phosphate floating around. Another example is mechanical work. In this example, the transfer of phosphate groups to special motor proteins in muscle cell causes the protein to change shape and pull on actin filaments, in turn causing cells to contract. So in other words, a protein moved. This also yields ADP and a third phosphate which is floating around. Another example is the transport work. In transport work, ATP drives the active transport of solutes across the membrane against their concentration gradient by phosphorylating certain membrane proteins. Also, this yields ADP and a third phosphate. There is an energy barrier that must be overcome before a chemical reaction can begin. Energy of activation is the amount of energy needed to push the reactants over an energy barrier or hill so the downhill part of the reaction can begin. So in this graph we want to go from point A to point B. Here notice that without an enzyme the energy of activation is much higher than with an enzyme shown here. So in other words enzymes allow the decrease in the energy of activation. Thus enzymes speed up a reaction by lowering the energy of activation barrier. So now let's discuss how a specific enzyme catalyzes a solid reaction. Well, we begin with an empty active site. The active site is a location on the enzyme where the substrate binds to the enzyme. In this example we will be discussing how the enzyme sucrase breaks down its substrate sucrose. Now sucrose enters the active site attaching by weak bonds. The active site changes shape slightly so that it embraces the substrate more snugly like a firm handshake. The strained bonds reacts with water and the substrate is converted to the products glucose and fructose. Notice that the bond between the glucose and the fructose is broken. The enzyme then releases the products and emerges unchanged from the reaction. Enzyme inhibitors block enzyme action and can regulate enzyme activity in a cell. So, in the case of normal binding, we have a substrate that binds to the active side of the enzyme, as we discussed in the previous slide. However, when there's inhibition, we talk about two different types of inhibition. The first is competitive inhibitor. The competitive inhibitor binds to the active site and thus prevents the substrate to bind to the active site. In the case of the non-competitive inhibitor, the inhibitor does not compete for the active site, but rather binds to a different location of the enzyme, which in turn changes the shape of the active site, preventing the substrate to bind. Thank you everyone for watching. Come visit us at the SSC if you have any questions. Good luck in all your studies and tune in for the next workshop.